stand together. I stood closer, walk with me. Granted, Jesus is my
We thank you that we can be in your house this morning, that we can pour our hearts, hearts out to you, Lord God, knowing that you hear our prayers even before we say them. You're the God of our fathers. You're the God, Lord God, our healer, our provider, and we thank you for that. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. I was talking with Doug Beto this morning, and, and if you don't know Doug, um, get a chance to know Doug, but Doug just wanted me to, to share his appreciation for all the prayers that have gone out on his behalf over these last weeks and months. Doug has had a number of, of health concerns. Most recently, he had back surgery, and he just really wanted to express his appreciation for those who have been praying for him, and he's just, he's doing so well, comparative, and so he's extremely appreciative of that. And that just brings it to, to the point of if, if prayer is something that you feel passionate about, if that's something that you feel like I can do that, I want to be able to be a part of that, I would invite you to submit your email to our email prayer chain, and when, when requests like Doug's come up, you will get an email on that, and then we as the corporate body can join together and be praying for people like Doug in Doug's situation. And likewise, if you have prayer concerns, it's a great avenue by which to share those concerns with people as well. So if you, if you have interest, you're not part of that current prayer chain, you say, that's, that's something I'm passionate about, that's something I'd like to be a part of, please give, uh, you can submit your email address to myself, you can give it to Pastor Chris, or you can certainly give it to uh, our Secretary Dawn, and we can get you signed up for the prayer chain. So last week, we were talking about this idea of change. We dealt with this, you know, somewhat in the sense we don't like change. Some of us maybe do, but overall, we always have this somewhat resistance to change. We want to perhaps have others change so that they are conforming to what our standard is, but when it comes to ourselves, we don't necessarily don't necessarily like it. But I want to, as, as, as we get started this morning, I want to emphasize, or perhaps we even re-emphasize, a couple of particulars when we talk about this idea of change. And I'm talking about life change, this, this stuff that goes on the inside, this heart change. And I believe that oftentimes, we end up defaulting to change coming in our own efforts. You know, in other words, it's change under our own power. And so we recognize there's this idea that I want to change something about myself. And maybe this is something that's a heart thing and I can't change it about myself. Or maybe it's something that's even a physical. Maybe there's an addiction piece there and I just, I want change. And yet what we find is when I try to make these changes on my own, perhaps I can see change for a, a small window, but that long-term change doesn't come unless there's something supernatural that happens. And that's what we dealt with last week. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit this week. Um, it would be almost like this idea of, of making these, these changes, these heart changes, these, these changes on our own. It's almost like if you gave a child up to raise themselves. You know, envision with me, you know, I'm not talking about little babies because little babies, they obviously need food first. So let's say once they eat, hit the ripe old age of two, Okay? They know how to open the refrigerator. They know how to find what they want to eat out of the refrigerator or the cupboards, unless you have child locks. Anyone have child locks in your house? Yes, they figure those out too, don't they? So once they have learned to be able to feed themselves, okay, at this point, we're going to let them go and we're going to let them raise themselves. You know, if you have multiple kids at home, you, you can really experience this well. Let's say you have, especially if you have twins, it's going to be wonderful, okay? You have twins, you, you put them at home alone at the age of two. And just let them go and just trust, you know, because our, our culture teaches this idea that, well, we're all good at heart. Watch it, okay? So you have these, these two-year-olds at home, and now you just let them go, and they're going to raise themselves. Can you imagine what that would be like? You know, let's say, let's say okay, we're going to do a little experiment. We're going to lay, we've introduced them to Snickers at the age of one, right? Okay, so, you know, because that's healthy. So you lay a Snickers bar. You have to unwrap it for them because at age one, they can't do it yet. Age two. So you lay it out there. You have the Snickers bars in the room. Nothing else is in the room. You have two children. They're both age of two. Who's going to get that Snickers bar? Oh, no, you go ahead and have it. 
No, 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 please, after you, right? Yeah, that's just not happening, you know? But this is idea of somehow this, this idea of getting this life change would be similar to allowing a child to, in a sense, raise themselves. They're not going to come with any kind of a moral heart condition, you know, moment. They're going to default to what they know in that intrinsic, that, that sin nature, that selfish nature, and they're going to go after it because they want it. And for us to assume that a child raising themselves would end up making these kind of, you know, good choices and, and be an outstanding, you know, citizen, that's just not happening. You know, without the external influence of a parent teaching and training a child for change, for heart change, heart molding, if you will, it's not happening. And likewise, when we try to do change on our own, try to make these life changes without God doing his work, his heart changing work in us, it's not working. It's not happening. And the second emphasis from last week is, so what do we do? Okay, if we recognize this idea that change can only come from God, what do we do? Do we, do we just sit on our hands and, and do nothing? And that's not at all true. I think our role is kind of threefold. I think first and foremost, we dealt with this last week, our first and foremost position is we need to recognize that we need change. And then secondly, we need to be praying, God, you've got to do this work in me. We have to pray to God and say, God, I, I'm, I need change. I recognize that I need change. I need you to do that change. You need to do something that only you can do. And then the third is really this idea of allowing him to do that change in us. You know, I just, I had some conversations this last week, and it comes to this idea of, well, we just need to do this. We just need to change. We just need to change. And yeah, you're, you know, that's kind of what I was communicating last week. But for us to think that we can do it on our own, you can't. And this is where it gets really hard and complex because it feels like, well, then I'm just doing nothing. Well, that's not it either because we do have a role and our role is to submit to the Holy Spirit and, and align our lives to be with that with the Holy Spirit. We dealt with this a number of weeks ago, maybe even months ago here, this Galatians 5 passage. And notice what it says. What we're going to find here in this Galatians passage is just real briefly, we're going to see how we have a sinful nature. And we're going to see how we have this, this sinful nature that's constantly drawing us, and we're, we have a role in it. It's, it's a resistance to it. And then we're going to flip back to what we just talked about last week in John chapter 3. We're going to emphasize the last part of what we dealt with, and then we're going to go on from, from there, and we're going to see how God does that work. So here's what it says. Paul writes to the church in Galatia. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. If you're feeling like you need change, and you can't find the change that you know needs to change in your life, that's like bondage. You know, there's no freedom there. And yet what we find in this passage right here, it says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. We're called to something different. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. I love this. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. That is two two-year-olds going after a Snickers bar. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they will bite and scratch and claw just to get what they want. So I say, walk by the Spirit. This is the idea, okay? So we have this role. We need this change, all right? We've accepted Christ. He's doing this changing work in us. And in that changing work in us, he's causing us and, and leading us to align ourselves, align our thought process with that with the Holy Spirit. So he says, I walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. And here we go. The acts of the flesh are obvious. The sexual immorality, the impurity, the debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And there you have this picture at this contrast, you know, it's like, I want this life change. I want it so bad, and I try, and I try, and I try, and it seems like I'm getting nowhere. It's just like my wheels are spinning. We need to take a step here, and we need to recognize what that change is going to look like. And I think what we're going to see here this morning then, as we look at this Gospel of John, chapter 3, we're going to see John the Baptist encounter this idea, and we're going to find disciples in there who are missing it. They need a change of heart. And John's going to help them to see that their heart is in the wrong place. It kind of shows where their heart is at. And so I, I want you to wrestle with that. I want you to wrestle with some of the changes that maybe you ad uh, identified last week, that you addressed last week, and just recognize that, you know, the Lord is at work. He's working. He desires to have these changes take place. 
You know, and with that, it comes, we have a role, we have a responsibility of aligning ourselves with the Spirit. So here we go. Last week, this is how we ended it. We said this the verdict. So Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He was that Pharisee, all right? He was the one, he was one of the 70, one of the Sanhedrin, one of the elite 70 Jewish teachers in all of Israel. And he's coming to Jesus and they have this interaction. And so Jesus comes down and he lays out this, you have to be born again, this stuff. And there's this, this interaction back and forth. And here we have the verdict and it is, this is the verdict. And Jesus says that this light has come into the world. You see this parallels so well with Galatians 5. Light has come into the world, but people love the darkness. In other words, you, have, you, have been, you see both sides of it. You see how the spirit is leading and it's contrasting, it's in conflict, which that's what the flesh is leading to, all right? But people have chosen to love the flesh, they've loved the darkness, as opposed to the light, because of their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. And then here we go. This was the last verse we dealt with last week. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. Change comes when we start to recognize who Jesus is and what it is that he desires to do. Once we have this clear picture of who Jesus is, that's the first step in really allowing him to do that changing work in our hearts. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done through God. And there's that, that last sentence, that point of emphasis. It's what God has done. God is the one that's going to do this changing work. And so we're wrestling with that today some more. So here we get into it. In John chapter 3, starting at verse 22. Um, some of the background here, we, we've talked in the past, remember when Jesus turned the water into wine, he had these big cauldrons, these big vases, these big jars, if you will, uh, that held 20 to 30 gallons of water. These, these jars, before he turned them into you know, wine, obviously, that was filled up with water for the purpose of ceremonial cleansing. So they had, this, they had this pattern, they had this role where they had to take this water, and oftentimes for ceremonial cleansing, they would pour it over them, um, he, their heads. You know, it, was it physically? Yeah. But was it physically cleansing? Really not all-encompassing. I don't think they used soap, you know. And we all know from our, you know, health classes in high school and such that without soap, it's just not working. You know, if, for, for teenagers, if you're not using soap in the shower, you should start using soap in the shower, Okay. <laughs> Just, just want to clarify that one point. Okay. Anyway, so there was this ceremonial cleansing. They called it ceremonial because it was symbolic in its act where it was basically depicted to show how God does this cleansing process. And so they would go in there basically representing, okay, Lord, you are the one that makes me clean. They would pour the water up over the top of them. Well, this is important to note because when we look at what we're about to deal with with baptism, because we're going to see John the Baptist baptizing, and we're going to talk about Jesus baptizing, there's not a salvation piece here with the baptism. But this is a ceremonial piece here that they're actually submitting to God in this act of, okay, God, I need you to do this cleansing work in me, and then they would baptize them. Okay, that's important to note because salvation comes through the atonement, which Jesus Christ lived his, his life, he, he bled, he died, he rose again and ascended to heaven. That's the salvation piece to it. So here's what we have in John 20, uh, chapter 3, verse 22. So after this, after those events with Jesus and Nicodemus, this is what it says, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them, and he baptized. So Jesus is out there, and he's baptizing. Now John, this is John the Baptist, also was baptizing. So you've got two guys out there baptizing. They're baptizing at Anon near Salem. I'll show you where that is in a moment. <clears throat> because there was plenty of water, and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John the Baptist was put in prison. This is Anon. I love this map. It's so much prettier than the previous maps that I've used because those you look at, it's like, well, this is overwhelming. Well, look at this. I mean, who doesn't like a giant camel on your map? You know? And so this is basically, this is Anon. This is where it's believed that they would have been baptizing. There's the Jordan River. It runs from the Sea of Galilee right here down to uh, the Dead Sea. All right. And this is Jerusalem. Jericho would have been right about here. And remember when we dealt with the Old Testament about a year ago, this is the path that they would have been coming up here, and then they would have crossed over into uh, Israel, which is, this is the promised land right in this area here. Okay, so it gives you a little idea as to what we're talking about. Last week, um, or previous weeks, we've been in Cana was over here, and Capernaum was up here, and so now they're down here by the, by the river. They did a little migration. And so they're here, and they're baptizing 
in this area. And as they're baptizing, an argument develops between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. In other words, what's going on, there's twofold. One is, I think that there's an argument as to, they're kind of saying, hey, that Jesus guy in his ceremonial washing, he's doing it different. He's doing it wrong. I don't think that that's okay. And then there's another aspect of it that we see here as he continues, is that they came to John and they said, Rabbi, remember that man way back in, in John chapter 1? The man that you looked at and you said, behold, there's the Lamb of God. Remember that one, the one that takes away the sin of the world? Remember when you said that? And John says, yes, I remember when I said that. And so they come to John, they say, Rabbi, which means teacher. They say, teacher, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, that one day when we were baptizing, the one you testified about, so they remember, that's important because John's going to point back to that. They testify. Remember that one that you talked about? You told us about him. Well, look, he's baptizing. You know, he's, he's doing what you're doing, only better. And everyone is going to him. And so there's this, there's this issue, you know, there's this popularity thing, because understand this, the disciples of John their esteem would have come a lot in the capacity of who John was. You know, who are you? Well, I'm John the Baptist's disciple. You know, I'm one of his disciples. I mean, the, the esteem there is, is super important. It's like the popularity thing in high school. You know, were you ever the most popular kid in school? Me either, you know. <laughs> you know, I, I wonder if the most popular kid in school ever knew that they were the most popular kid in school. You think? Or is everyone always thinking that someone else is the most popular kid in school and trying to be like that one? But, you know, but, but there's this idea. So in, in high school, I remember you'd have... And, and, and I know it still exists now because I talk to my daughter and such, but you have certain tables, okay? And people belong to certain tables. And there's one table that is always like the table that everyone wishes that they could be a part of. And then there's a table that you sit at, you know, in, in a sense. And so there's always this, because when, if you can sit at that table with these people, you know what that means is you belong there. You have this esteem. You have this popularity piece that goes along with that. And if you can be there, then you are something. You have arrived. I didn't really sit at any tables, mostly because I kept getting kicked out of tables. Yeah, actually, what I would do during lunch instead is I would go down to the wood shop and I'd just spend the lunchtime in the wood shop. I know, away from people. I like my solitude. Anyway, maybe I was antisocial. Okay. Uh, but that's kind of what we have going on here. We have this, this popularity piece that's, that's kind of going on with this John, this is, this is a big deal. Everyone's going to Jesus here. We were following you. Now all of them are going over. They're seeing something else there. You know? And this is pretty revealing for the disciples' heart position. You know what I'm saying? You know, because they've already heard John the Baptist's testimony about Jesus. They've already heard John say, that is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They've already heard that. And now they're concerned, here's the thing, John. He's got more disciples. He's better. You're not as important as you used to be. Where do we fit in with all this? And now look at John's response. is just fabulous. It's absolutely amazing. Remember starter jackets? Anyone? You had to be a child of the 90s to remember starter jackets. I remember, I remember starter jackets. I never had a starter jacket. It's that whole popularity thing again, you know? So in the 90s, if you lived in the 90s, you don't count, Chris, because you were born in, what, 93? Yeah, this was before then. So in the 90s, if you had a starter jacket, you were somebody. You know what I'm saying? Starter jackets. People, and I'm not kidding about this. This was, people were killing people and taking away their coats. I mean, is that just not messed up? And what's fascinating is in our culture, that kind of makes sense. I mean, we kind of look at it and we kind of shake our heads, but really with what we do and how we live our culture, this idea of who we are belongs so much as to who we're tied to or what we have. You know, now it's not starter jackets anymore. Now it's like Under Armour and Nike. Nike's been huge for decades now. They have to be, they have to be multi-thousandaires by now. But this idea of the starter jacket, it was just like, if you didn't have it, you didn't really fit. And now... They're nothing. You know, it's, it's just, it's a fascinating concept. But this is John's reply. So he says, a person can receive only what is given to him from heaven. You know, in other words, what, what John is saying is, okay, I need to be content with what God has entrusted me to. And even, even beyond that, he says, 
I feel like John's saying, what choice do I have? You know, this is what the Lord has given for me. This is my job. This is what he has given for me to do. In other words, John, John is saying, the, the number of disciples that I have is not the problem. That's not really the issue. You're looking at, at who's po more popular. You're looking at, at who's greater in this sense, and you're missing it, and you're basing it solely on, on numbers. And he says, rather, the issue is, am I serving God with what he has given to me? Am I using what I have to serve him? You know, we've dealt with this in the past. We've dealt with, you know, do you sing? Then use what you have to give back to God. You know, these disciples are basically, they're looking at this and they're saying, this, this isn't fair. This is cry foul. And we compare ourselves to people all the time. We look at people who have starter jackets and we wish we were like them. We wish we had what they had. We look at other people and what they have. We look at other people and how they live. We find ourselves wishing that we were them or that we had what they had. And we often cry the same things to the disciples saying, oh, it just doesn't seem fair. It just doesn't seem right. But yet you have what the Lord has given to you. If you can build, then build. If you can dance, then dance. You want to see me dance? No, you don't. Nobody wants to see me dance. The one thing that we all have in common is we all can love, and so let us love. In verse 28, then, he goes on, and he says, You yourselves, this is John the Baptist talking, you yourselves can testify. In other words, you just said that I had said this, okay? You yourselves have said this, is what he's saying. So you, can t you yourselves can testify that I said that I am not the Messiah, okay? But I am sent ahead of him. In other words, he, he's saying to his disciples, you yourselves just said, I said he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, all right? I'm not the Messiah. In other words, there's, there's something bigger. He is who I, who I said he is, you guys need to hear what I say and now really be okay with it because here's how he follows it up. He gives this story, and this is just fabulous. So he gives this story about this bride belonging to the bridegroom. All right? And that seems to make sense. All right? We see it in the, in the Old Testament all the time. We see it in the New Testament all the time where there's this illustration of marriage that is used throughout Scripture that points back to God. In the Old Testament, what you found was you found God and you find Israel, and Israel is oftentimes depicted as, in a sense, it doesn't use the word bride, but it is this nation that is dearly loved by God. But what you see in the symbolism is Israel was adulterous in their idol worship, you know, so there's this, there's this relationship piece, and Israel is seen as an adulterous nation. In other words, Israel has cheated on God and that relationship. So you see this imagery of marriage throughout. You see parables where Jesus talks about these, this bridegroom and this, this banquet that's going to be set, and people are invited into this banquet, and some come and some don't come, and some hesitate. But the bottom line is there's this imagery that's constantly throughout there. Throughout the New Testament, we see the church is represented as, as to, said about as being the bride of Christ. So this imagery of marriage is over and over throughout scriptures. And here's John the Baptist, and he's giving us this imagery of marriage. And this is what he says, the bride belongs belongs to the bridegroom. He says, the friend who attends the bridegroom, in other words, this is the best man, if you will, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means here in a second. The, the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. Here's, you know, in our culture, the best men don't have a whole lot of responsibility, probably because men, and especially young men, are irresponsible, you know. But they, they have a role, you know, and their primary role is to, you know, carry the ring, right? Is there really much else? I mean, maybe it's to kind of keep the groom calm, you know, but for the most part, there's not a whole lot of role. In, in the Jewish uh, times, what would happen is the, the, the best man, if you will, this bride, bridegroom's friend, he would basically take the groom himself and, and drive him, if you will. They didn't have cars yet. They were a couple years back. They would drive him to the bride's house, and they would together then pick up the, the bride, and then they would, you know, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, and then the, the best man would take them back to the ceremony for the banquet. So he had this major role, and he was this behind-the-scenes type person where he was intended to get this ready and this ready and this ready. One of his major roles, after the ceremony was actually done, what he would do is he would escort the bride and the groom to what's called the wedding chamber. 
And this is where they would consummate the marriage. And so he would basically allow them into the wedding chamber and he would stay there and stand guard so that nobody interrupted the wedding couple during uh, the consummation of the marriage. And he would not let anyone in and he would wait there until the bride or the groom rather said his name and he would hear his voice. And then he knew that the wedding was complete and he would be overjoyed for them and what they did. But the bottom line is his, his job was to always point to the couple. That was his role. It wasn't about him. It was about the couple. I remember when I was in, well, we just graduated college. Sarah and I were married. And it, so what happened was I, I, my roommate was very selfish. In college, and, and I got married on one weekend on a Saturday, and then he scheduled his, his wedding on the next Saturday, like the very next Saturday. You know, and so I had to cut my honeymoon short because... He stood up in my wedding, I had to stand up in his wedding, you know, which is just very selfish of him. <laughs> I know, I know, yeah, you get me, okay? So anyway, so we're standing up at each other's wedding, and so when he comes to stand up in, in my wedding, I, I made the rules very clear. Not that they were my rules, but they were communicated to me that this needs to happen this way. Um, and I knew that if they didn't happen this way, that I would be the one that was in trouble for it, okay? So I communicated to my guys, there were seven of them, and I said, all right, guys, you guys got to listen up here. I know, it was a big party, huh? Uh, listen up, guys, this is very important. There will be no pranks, no jokes, period, during the ceremony, Nothing, okay? Nothing. I just I couldn't emphasize it strong enough. And, and so we made it clear, and the wedding went, it was just fine. And so likewise, then a week later, um, he didn't make that stipulation. <laughs> right, you know. So, you know, and, and anyway. Uh, so what happened, now I, I will say I wasn't behind this, but I was involved in it. And so it wasn't a big deal. But you know, sometimes groomsmen, they're, they're funny because they're you're young and they'll do things that m most men wouldn't do. And so you have, he had five, I think. I was not his best man. He was not my best man. But we were in each other's wedding. So his best man, his name was Mike Olson, great last name. Um, he, had this, he had this idea um, that he's what we're going to do. Okay, so when they ask for the rings, we're not going to find the rings. You know, which we've seen that before, okay? But then what he did is he, he gave us each his big pockets of change. You know, so we loaded up our pockets with coins. Okay, and so then when it came time for the rings, he's looking, he's, he, I don't have it. He looks to the next guy, he looks at the next guy. I was probably last in line, he looks at the next guy, do you have it? I, I don't have it. So we are all, all digging in our pockets, and then at the same time, we all inside out our pockets, you know? And so all this change goes just flying everywhere. And so then we all get down on our hands and knees, and we're looking for the ring, you know, just totally interrupting the ceremony. The sad part of it was, we took something that was intended to be on them, and we made it about ourselves. You know, I can say that now because I'm so much more mature. But, but in reality, I mean, do you see the, do you see the parallel? You know, as, as, as a groomsman, as a best man, that was not our role to draw attention to ourselves, which we did. Our job was to focus attention on them. And that's exactly what John the Baptist is getting at with his story. He's saying, my role is not to bring attention to myself. My role is to put attention back onto Christ. And if that means all of my disciples leave, then all of my disciples leave, because that's my job, is to keep all the attention on him. And that's just, that's fabulous. When you look at these, you know, you understand the, 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 the real pull when it comes to our own esteem. We talk about wanting to have, you know, high self-esteem. I understand what you're saying. However, there's something greater in there and understanding really what it means, who we are in Christ's eyes. And John the Baptist got it. His disciples, I think, were struggling with it here at this time. And so that makes a little bit more sense when you see what John is saying here, that his heart is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine. This is what John the Baptist says. That joy is mine. In other words, this has come. My joy is being made complete because I have heard the voice of Christ, and it is now complete. And then he says this. He says, he, this is Jesus, he must become greater, and I must become less. That does not fit our culture. You know, our culture is always, all right, building up our careers. We must be greater. We must improve. We must, we must do this and this and this. And that's what our culture pushes, pushes, pushes. But this reality, and this is so countercultural, Jesus must become greater, and I must become less. 
and that's in the church, and that's in our individual lives. That is what encompasses all of John the Baptist's message. Everything that he does is about Jesus becoming greater and him becoming less. I think we need to come to an understanding. We need to come to this this point where we see this accurate picture of who Jesus really is. Because if he's just another man out there doing this, that, or the other thing, like in, in kind of what the disciples saw here, then we're left with, oh, he's a threat. He's someone that's going to get into the way of what it is that I want, what it is that, that boosts my career, like John the Baptist's disciples. But when we can start to see him for who he really is, he is the son of God, he is greater, and I am less, that puts kind of everything into the position that maybe it needs to be in. When we come to see Jesus for who he really is, we see his greatness. And when we see his greatness, I, I think we see how our hearts need to be changed. When we come face to face with how great Jesus is, we can't help but come to this point recognizing I need change in my life. And we only see that we need the change, but because of his greatness, we can see and know that he can do that change in us. You know, when we look at our behaviors and our changes that we feel like we, that need to be different, it starts with a change of heart. It has to. We need to stop trying to change the behavior without first asking God to do that work in our hearts. So look at this picture. John, John the Baptist is going to give us this, this pretty accurate picture of who Jesus is as we conclude this, this chapter. So John the Baptist says, the one who comes from above is above. Not only that, it just makes sense. And so what he's saying is, Jesus came from above. He came from, from heaven. And because of that, he's above everything. All right? I mean, it just makes sense. And then he goes on, and this also just makes sense. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth. In other words, John the Baptist is saying, for me, I'm from the earth. I belong to the earth. There's a stark difference here. Huge contrast to what we're looking at. And not only is he from the earth, he belongs to the earth, but he speaks from one who is from the earth. This is wonderful, okay? He can only speak from his experience that he has had on, on earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. In other words, Jesus, who came from heaven, it doesn't matter what you think of him. He's already above all things. But then hear what he says. He, so we see the disciples testify that John the Baptist said. We see John the Baptist testify about who Jesus is. But now Jesus is going to give this testimony, and this is what John the Baptist says about it. He says, Jesus testifies to what he has seen and heard. What has Jesus seen and heard? He is from heaven. He is from above. He has seen God face to face. He is God. He has seen heaven with his own eyes. He has experienced it. And now he has come to testify about it. You know, John the Baptist is basically saying, I can only give you what I see here on earth. This guy can give you what is going on in heaven. He's greater. And that's a huge greater that I just told you guys. So he testifies to what he has seen and heard. Everything that Jesus has seen and heard is coming from heaven. Firsthand. He's not a prophet you know, the prophets would get this message from God and they would communicate it to the people. And that's a great message. But what John the Baptist is saying, he is directly from there. He didn't receive a message. He is the message. But no one accepts his testimony. You know, that's, that's like someone going to a baseball game, watching the game, coming back and giving you a report of the game in detail of each at bat, each score, each run, each out, and you say, I don't believe you. You know? I mean, he's there. He's experienced it. He's the one that's giving you the testimony. If you give it, okay, you got two guys. One's giving you the testimony from he was at the baseball game and one who was sleeping. Who's got the better testimony? Well, I'm going with the one who was actually there. In verse 33, he says, whoever has accepted it, has certified that God is truthful. So in other words, whoever has, has received his testimony and said, yep, I believe what Jesus is saying is true, whoever receives it and says, yep, that's it, has certified that God is truthful, has understood that what Jesus is saying is true. For the one who, who 
for the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. You know, not just the message, he is the message. He's speaking the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. God has given the Spirit, and there's no limit to what that Spirit can do. I don't know where you're at and what kind of changes you're feeling that the Lord is bringing up in your lives. Like, man, I wish this was different about me. I wish this was different about me. God has not limited the Holy Spirit's ability to do anything in your life. We limit it by saying, I don't think I can trust you. I don't think I can trust your testimony. And so we hold back and we don't let the Holy Spirit do the work that God wants to do in us. Or we just simply say, you know, that's too vulnerable. I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to share those things. So I'm just going to kind of try to do these changes on our own. And we see success for maybe a month. Maybe we're successful up to a year. But the bottom line is we find ourselves in that same spot that we've always been. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Everything that you're facing in your life, every challenge, every question, every temptation, Jesus is above it. Every struggle that you have, Jesus is above it. Everything has been placed into his hand, and he's got it. He is above it. Let him rule your hearts. Let him change your hearts. In verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Do you believe... Do you believe that Jesus can change your heart? And do you believe that Jesus will change your heart? You know, a relationship with Jesus begins with, it's, it's a simple prayer. You know, it's, it's Jesus, save me from my sins, change my heart. I can't do it on my own. I need you to do that. You know, and that's really it. That's, that's what it looks like. And we sometimes make things so complex and theological, but the message of it is, it's right there. And I understand that sometimes changes can be overwhelming. We feel like I'm just getting nowhere. I'm just spinning my wheels. I wish this was different. I'm not getting, it's just, and we're stuck. I'm just telling you, pray, God, I don't know what's going on, but I need you to do this change in me. And every day when you wake up, you may feel like I, I've gotten nowhere. And pray, God, I need you to do this change in me trusting in his testimony, and I, I just feel so strongly that if you're willing to, to say, all right, God, I'm going to trust you to do this. I'm going to trust you to do this change in me because I can't seem to do it on my own. I need you to do that, and if you can just trust him to do that change, I'm so convinced that you're going to find yourself in a place where he has changed things, and maybe you didn't even realize that they were changed. My dad gives a testimony of, of his life, and a pastor approached him. I know I've shared it before, if you haven't heard it, you know, you'll, you'll enjoy it. If you have heard it, well, consider it a reminder. But my dad shares this testimony where he was a, he was a young man. He was a, uh, probably 19, you know, 19 even at the time. He would have been married, actually, probably even with uh, well, one kid, for sure. Very young. My mom was like 26 years old and had four kids. Go, Mom. I don't know what she was thinking. I have no idea. Uh, but my dad shares a story. A pastor approached him, and just his name is Ross. He said, Ross, what is keeping you from, from giving yourself to the Lord? My dad's response was, I can't stop what I'm doing. In other words, what his response really was, I can't change that which I know needs to change. And he gives us testimony, and he just, he said, there, there came a day, and I don't know all the ins and outs of what my dad was, was really wrestling with and dealing with, but he said, my dad's testimony, he said, there came a day where I looked back, and God had done the change. You know? He, he, he didn't really recognize, like, oh, there was this, there was this moment where all, suddenly everything was just gone, but he looked back, and it's like, he took that, and he took this, and he took that. He changed it. It's nothing that my dad did on his own. It's just something that the Lord did for him. I'm just so convinced that the Lord can do and will do those changes in us as well. It may seem like I'm getting nowhere. Trust him and keep praying for that change. Just trust him. And I just am so convinced that you're going to find yourself in this place where you're going to look back and say, wow, God, you did an amazing thing. You did something that only you could do. So trust him with the change. Kevin, will you come?
Let's all stand as we sing this last song to the Lord. convinced that there's probably three different types of people here in response to this morning. I think there's some who have, have experienced that kind of change. You know, that doesn't mean that God is done doing that change. I think that there's constantly a work in our hearts that the Lord is wanting to do, you know. And so there's some who have experienced it, they've tasted it, and it's like, God, is so good, I wouldn't be where I am if it weren't for him. I think there's some of us who are wrestling with this, like, I have this change that just needs to happen, I just need God to do it, and they're really wrestling with some of these things that we've talked about. And I think there's probably some here who maybe you have been so burnt, maybe you've been so hardened, that you, all you can see in your heart is like, well, they need to change, and they need to change, and they need to change, but change is not for me. I'm going to pray for all three. Because I just feel like this is something the Lord is constantly working and anyone who chooses to follow him and those who have not yet chosen to follow him, he is doing a work on our hearts and that's where he starts with our lives. He changes our hearts. Let me pray. Father, I give you thanks for this changing work that you do. I pray for those who have experienced this grace, they've experienced the kind of change that you can bring and only you can bring in their hearts. I pray that their testimony can testify to that which you do, can do, and will do. The things that you have done for them, I just pray that it'll be on their lips and they can share that kind of change. And that you will continue that work that you have begun in their hearts. For those who are wrestling with this idea of needing this change, I just pray that you will give them a taste of what it is that you can bring into their lives. I pray that you can give them a taste of how you can change their hearts. You can make it from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And for those who, who see no need for change, maybe they've just hardened themselves, I just pray that you, you make that first step towards them to bring that, that heart just a step softer. Help them to reflect on their need for you and their need for change as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, as you leave, if you, if you were here last...